I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 309. It's August 2022. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we cannot talk about on the first and the only wrestling podcast. The Triple H era has begun in WWE with a lot of returning talent. Talent that he was a fan of that this man was not a fan of are back. Bailey has returned. Yo Sky has returned. Dakota Kai has been re-signed. Karrion Cross has been re-signed and immediately inserted into the top program on SmackDown. What do you think of, uh, I guess, the second full week here of Triple H's uh, WWE? Well, most importantly, he got a crowd to boo Liv Morgan. So that was really impressive to me. Well, yeah, I guess Summer SummerSlam happened and SummerSlam was just a show like it was fine. I, I I think a lot of people liked the main event of that show more than I did. I thought it was really it was, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I th- like the last man standing step sounds good until you get two big slow guys like Roman and Brock out there. And then it's like they're big and slow anyway. And then you have a stipulation where there's a lot of 10 counts <laughs> and fake, ten, you know, fake tank and eight counts and guys getting up at nine. And mm-hmm. it's like, it's just really slow anyway. <laughs> Those guys are gonna have a slow match anyway, and then the stip makes it even slower. But anyway, yeah. But they booked the finish on that show where uh, with Liv Morgan and Ronda Rousey that made everyone look bad. They <laughs> Liv is the champion. She tapped out. Ronda got pinned. Ronda looks bad because she because she lost. The referee looks like an idiot because he didn't see Liv Morgan tapping. Liv Morgan looks bad because she tapped out. She's babyface champion who tapped out clean. And then the crowd on SmackDown let Liv know what they thought of her and uh, boot her out of the building, which didn't seem possible, doesn't seem possible, given that uh, she's a very popular uh, figure in certain circles of the fandom, I suppose. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think they for I. I'm going to start and stop 300 thoughts here (laughs) before I actually spit one out. Generally, I have no problems with what Triple H has done so far, except for that. That was a terrible finish that made everyone look bad, and now they've uh, apparently got the crowd to turn on Liv Morgan already. Yeah, I mean, for her sake, you hope it's a one-week anomaly because if... I mean, worst-case scenario, I mean, I think this is a... This is, you would hope with Triple H in charge, they won't... If the crowd is bound and determined to boo her, they can turn her. It's wild that you would have to, but... <laughs> But on the other hand, it's I mean, it's the same problem they have now with her as a baby face until Rhonda and or Charlotte come back. There are no <laughs> there are no people. It's the Norm McDonald. All the stars are here bit. Yes, um, that's Smackdown Women's Division. It's just <laughs> it's Raquel Rodriguez and uh, you got who else is in there? You got you got Shotzi and Aaliyah and yeah. Natty. Yeah. Like and Carmella, I think, and it's just it's just it's rough going. Um, so it's like it's one thing, it's like, well, you could turn her, but then you don't have any baby faces, but you don't really have any strong heels anyway. I guess they're gonna do something with Shayna, <laughs> they're gonna do a match at the very least with yeah. uh, with Liv and Shayna. So maybe that'll maybe that'll turn things around, but yeah, that's yeah, that that was just to me the most striking thing was. You would not be surprised on a Vince McMahon book show of for him to get a very popular babyface booed out of the building because that happened like once every two months for the last five years. Um, But yeah, it was a little surprising to see that happen so quickly on on the Paul Levesque shows. But yeah, overall, like I think if people were were wanting like a full scale reboot change, that's I don't I don't get a sense that that's coming. And again, we're still very early, early times here. It's only in the, the second week of his t- television uh, has just finished. So 
like maybe that again maybe if we look at this in six months it will be drastically different but as of now you know the show the show felt at least raw on monday certainly felt like it had more of a an emphasis on in ring you know longer matches and matches with a point um and i felt like the show connected pretty well like there was a like kind of a there was a lot of like connecting segments rather than just cutting to another part of the building or whatever for a different interview where you know the like the opening of the show is you know becky comes out and then bianca comes out and then becky goes backstage and then they showed the attack and bianca runs backstage and kind of doing that all in one motion i thought there's like there's a few times on there where like one interview or segment bled into something else that i thought it's like oh that's kind of different they don't they don't often do that kind of stuff so you know, there's little tweaks to it. And obviously, like, Tommaso Ciampa is getting a U.S. title match. And as you already mentioned, Carrie and Cross and Scarlett are back on on SmackDown. We're immediately put into... God, poor... You've put me in a position where I have to, like, defend or feel sorry for Drew McIntyre. <laughs> because, you know, this poor guy, he's been building up to get this match with Roman Reigns. They kept delaying it seemingly. And now he's finally getting the big stadium show match. And in the middle of the build for that, they bring back the guy who lost to Jeff Hardy in two minutes to lay him out. Certainly a choice. Like I would have, I got no problem with carrying across. Like he's just an entrance. He can't wrestle. That's fine. It's a good entrance. It, he's apparently a very nice man. Uh, I, I mm-hmm. think he, I think he has big mechanic from Independence, Missouri energy. <laughs> like I, I just I, I take think, take away his entrance, take away Scarlet. I don't know what you got, but yeah, I mean that's that was the Adam Cole promo in NXT, and then they went and did it. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, he's he definitely feels like an and then the bell rang guy to me, but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my, my defining memory of cross now is at the new Japan strong tapings. I went to in Philadelphia a couple months ago, his match was after the, uh, intermission. Yeah. So like, we're like kind of looking at the merch table and like it's him and, uh, Yuya Uemura. Right. And the crowd is fully behind Uemura. And maybe right. that's just because, you know, he's one of the more popular and like well-known of the, the LA dojo guys. But I was still like, oh, that's kind of surprising because you would think the guy who was on WWE TV because it didn't seem like it was a like a New Japan crowd was at that show. It was just sure. like, you know, an indie wrestling show. Um, and then I literally <laughs> and again, this is anecdotal, but there was two people sitting in front of me that when they announced him as the winner, because they, they were not at their seats when he came out, they were still in the bathroom or whatever. Go. Oh, that was Killer Cross. Huh. He looks so different. <laughs> and then he walked to the back and I was like, that was kind of how it felt to like, I don't even know if how many people realized that this was the guy that was on, uh, that was on NXT, NXT and then, and then raw very briefly. So maybe that's a good thing that he grew his hair out and he looks a little different. Maybe people will kind of forget that he was, you know, on the show for six weeks in bondage gear, losing to Jeff Hardy and whoever else. I like that. At least he's in theory, new blood. And like Drew and Roman is kind of a new match, but both those guys have been on top for several years at this point. And so I'm all for injecting new blood into the show. I'm not sure I would have done it with the guy, like you said, who was in bondage gear and jobbed out to Jeff Hardy in two minutes, but I'm at least willing to give it a shot. And I think it's a test of Triple H and it's a test of the audience. It's like, will the audience have patience um, with a guy who can't work? <laughs> <laughs> and will Triple H book a guy book to the guy's strengths and not have him go out there and try to do a 20 minute match and uh, I think Roman's a bad opponent for him I think Drew is a better opponent for him because even though he's a big bulky guy Drew will work for both of you if you can't work um, mm-hmm. but but yeah you do feel for Drew at a, <laughs> where he's He's the, the baby face going for uh, going for the title in the stadium show. And after he's been banging the drum for years to get a UK stadium show. And mm-hmm. then uh, and then Cross is just injected into the picture. It's interesting. But uh, how about what do you think of the uh, the Bailey 
Eosky Dakota Kai trio. A lot of rhyming. Like, yeah. In that, uh, I, no, I mean, it was exciting for, for all those people to be back. I, uh, I kind of thought maybe it was time for Bailey to be a baby face when she came back, but um, they need some heels from Bianca because they, they turned Becky face, thankfully. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm okay with that. It's cool that, you know, Io Shirai, obviously that's, that's like a no brainer hunter choice for me based on how Dakota Kai was booked when she was in Hunter's NXT. I was a little surprised to see that she would be a name that he, you know, saw big things in, or maybe his thought was who's a name out there that we can bring back that we can pin when we start doing tag matches. Sure. But regardless, I mean, it could have been anyone that's in NXT or you could have repackaged somebody that's already on the show and he chose to resign her. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's cool. That immediately, you know, new faces uh, always, always makes the show a little bit more interesting, a little more exciting. Um, the, the stuff they did on Monday, like I felt like maybe they were a little overexposed on Monday. They really built the first two hours of that show all around them and Bianca. Um, they did like two talking segments, a brawl, and then a match, and then another brawl. And yeah. they've kind of set up that Becky will be out because she hurt her shoulder in the, the SummerSlam match. Um, and so it looks like it's a, a six person or a, a six woman feud where it's Bianca with Asuka and Alexa against Bailey and and EO and and Dakota. So it's like, all right, that's that's a direction, and it's a way to keep uh Asuka and Alexa, who both have felt pretty directionless, even you know, prior to Vince McMahon being ousted. And so it's something for them to do as well and get them in the mix with the top program. Uh, but yeah, it's it's early days still. Uh, but it's it's new, fresh faces, and it's a bunch of very talented people. So yeah, that's that's something to be excited about, I think. It was the most most watched raw in like two years this week too and they were helped by they had a commercial free first hour and they did a lot of picture in picture stuff but people uh people were interested as far as uh watching it live or watching it uh same day on their dvr more people mm-hmm. than for the first time for did this week than they have in two years so there's that yeah i'll be interested to see i don't think the number's gonna crater but i'll be interested to see because i do think they did a pretty good job of I mean, most of the segments built to something for next week or, or down the road. Like a, it didn't, there wasn't a lot of fluff on it. So it's like, can you get people interested in, you know, Champa, who's been Mrs. Lackey, Mrs. Young Boy, right on on TV wrestling the most protected guy in your whole company, basically, uh, not named Roman Reigns, right? Um, can you get people into this Bianca and Bailey thing? Um, yeah, it's like, will people come back to keep sampling on week two, or was it just that kind of curiosity bump after, after the big show? But yeah, like I said, I think, I think they did enough. It's hard for me because again, because the show, the show was not a, a total revamp. The production is still the same. The announcers are still the same. Yeah. Um, announcers are certainly looser. I think especially Michael Cole. (laughs) Yeah. As he pointed out on the air during SummerSlam. (laughs) Yes. Um, but on the raw side, it's, it still feels very much like the same show. We've just got a few new people on it. So we're again, it's, it's very early days here. So it's hard for me to get too excited. But yeah, you got you got some fresh faces. You've got some fresh matchups. And yeah, let's let's hit the ground running and see if if Paul's got any, you know, how he goes uh you know, as, as a wise man once said, it's, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So, you know, again, where are we in week six or week eight or week 12 is probably going to be more interesting or, or give us a better feel for how Paul as an ongoing uh, booker is. You mentioned there are a lot of long matches on Raw. I'm not against that. You got to fill that time somehow. Mm-hmm. But there was like, what, Bianca and EO went like, 18 minutes there were there were matches that got a ton of time but didn't necessarily need to get a ton of time mm-hmm. 
So there's still some aspects of like time filling that are very much going on there. And SmackDown feels more like the Gaga show. Like they think they're booking Saturday night's main event in 1987 <laughs> uh, with a lot of skits and backstage stuff and shorter matches. Like as far as, you know, I think McAfee is good in, in is much better on SmackDown than he is on pay-per-views just because he's better in small doses or when he's speaking for only five minutes at a time, instead of when he has to speak for 15 minutes at a time or what have you. So I think, I think that kind of booking maybe works better for SmackDown, but yeah, it's we'll, we'll see what we'll see where we go with this here. So clash the castle coming up. Shane Baszler will be wrestling for the SmackDown women's championship on that show. She's wrestling with Morgan and uh champa and lashley is this week on raw on monday and the women's tag titles are coming back a tournament will start on raw on monday a lot of speculation that sasha and naomi are coming back not sure not sure about that i wouldn't rule it out but like i'm not as sure as everyone else is those two are going to show up on monday yeah i mean it's interesting that they didn't show a bracket yes um or even they didn't announce this on SmackDown. They did like a, a dot com afterwards, right? It, it was on SmackDown. Oh, they did announce it on SmackDown. Okay. It was just I, a very brief, like they did. Uh, they just showed a graphic for it basically on SmackDown. And the mm-hmm. announcers talked about it for a second. And then like they had Adam Pierce cut a promo for it on. Digital. Okay. That's what I saw. Yeah. So yeah, that's interesting. You would certainly think then, well, if it's not them, they must have like somebody else returning. <laughs> Uh, or something maybe an nxt team is gonna be in it like something there um or the other option is it's very underwhelming and it's gonna be like four teams yeah. um so yeah we'll see i would again you would think if you're if you're doing this considering how hotly charged that whole s- situation was um yeah i think you would you would want to like again that would be a, a good way to mark your territory and mark that this is a new era is unlike the previous guy in charge. You could actually book these championships to mean something. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. So we'll, we'll see, but yeah, I I don't, I didn't necessarily get a sense. I know there was like some vague allusions to it. And then uh, there's maybe some confusion over Sasha being pulled from the Chicago comic con, but then I think she was there anyway. Yeah. So I think I think just a tweet got deleted or something and people freaked out about that. So um yeah, I don't I don't I don't get a strong sense of if they are or aren't coming back. It's like Sasha would make sense at this point because I like she's from Paul's NXT. Like I don't I don't know like what relationship Naomi has other than that. Well, if it's if it was Vince and Vince's whole entourage and now Pritchard's power is reduced and Johnny Ace is gone. And so she's just coming back because, you know, there's a new boss in town, but it's, it's like Sasha coming back would seems more likely to me, I guess, than Naomi, than Naomi necessarily coming back, but maybe they would both come back just because it's, maybe they felt like it was a Vince thing and Vince is gone now. I don't know. Yes, it will be interesting to see how all of that plays out. AEW had a lot of content this week. They had Battle of the Belt special on Saturday. They had Rampage on Friday. They had Dynamite on Wednesday. They have Quake by the Lake coming up on Wednesday. They let the New Japan America people name these shows, I think. I guess. There was some good wrestling on AEW this week. Um, It still feels like they're... uh, they're promoting 700,000 shows at once and they I'm still not sure what my I don't want to be the anti AW guy because that's like that bus is pretty full as you pointed out mm-hmm. but my one of my problems with that company from the beginning is that there doesn't seem to be a central f- focus like i would like you know the world title to be the focus of the show and instead their whole thing is just smorgasbord or charcuterie board or here's what we have there's this and 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 there's this anyway so john moxley is wrestling chris jericho 
they're they're the only match announced and not even announced but hinted at for um for all out is uh my mind has gone to oh it's eddie kingston and sammy guevara Mm -hmm. like not a world title match it's like they maybe because they don't know if if punk is going to be back in time for the pay-per-view that's in four weeks i don't know but they just they're they're doing the thing where they promote 30 shows at once they're running another wrestling company at the simultaneously and they're running ring of honor stuff on all these AEW shows that are packed anyway it's like there's good wrestling on these shows but as far as like what the direction is i have no i no earthly idea well it was interesting to me because the big i think the biggest angle on the show this past week was the adam cole and red dragon turning on the young bucks and hangman uh saving the young bucks to set up something for the trios tournament yes um which i think there was when tony khan talked about the trios belts whatever that was six months ago or whatever he said i have the belts they're ready to go they're i'm not going to bring them back until kenny omega is back or something to that effect um now maybe at the time he didn't know that cm punk was going to break his foot but if the idea was that Kenny was coming back at this show and he, but he's not going to be in the trios tournament, I assume he's wrestling John Moxley at this show then. Because if Punk's not there, what else do you have for like your biggest show of the year main event? I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> well, I, I guess last year's show was main evented by Christian. So I guess it doesn't. I guess the the spectacle of it being a big time, you know, travel weekend wrestling show is sells it for people. Like it's gonna like I don't know. It's it's there's they've already sold their tickets and whatever. So I feel like whatever they announce, the people that are going to that show are gonna enjoy, and the people that buy the shows are going to like it. But I do. But just by process of elimination, like Brian Danielson is back, but he just did a job on TV. And is also in the same faction as Moxley. So I don't think they're doing Moxley and Danielson. Right. I don't think they're doing Moxley and Daniel Garcia. Right. For the title and the biggest show of the year. Right. Like they're doing Moxley and Jericho on television. So, I right. mean, I guess they could do a BS finish in that and then do a rematch at the pay-per-view, but that's not really the AEW thing. Typically not what they do. Right. Um, so, you would think it's like, well, who's left there? You know, Christian Jungle Boy will likely be a match on the show. Bucks and Hangman versus Red Dragon and Adam Cole will probably be a thing on this show. The yeah, the apparently there there will be a, a trios tournament, and then the finals will be at that show. So that right. seems right. They don't, they don't have much time to do a tournament. Maybe it's just going to be like three teams. But <laughs> Dude, um, this is what I'm talking about. It's like, they have a month. If they, yeah. they've, they've half-assed announced a tournament none of the participants just that eh, it'll be happening yeah <laughs> i think they did a thing on rampage where the best friends said they were going to be in it with with our yeah Kansas. yep yeah so there's yeah there's it's three one, teams so the thing here <laughs> and i think the disconnect for me or where we maybe differ is at the end of it, the reason I am more forgiving of AEW's faults, I don't, I don't deny them, and I don't necessarily disagree with most of what you said, sure. except for the weird thing about Powerhouse Hobbs last week. Um, he has breasts. He has a nice manly chest. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's not go down that road again. But like, it's because they tend to come up with the matches and then work backwards. And so at the end of whatever these winding roads are, whether the, the roads are, are good or not, whether the journey is fun or not, and a lot of times it can feel rushed or incomplete or thrown together or whatever, it's like, I'm like, well, I'm going to get a good wrestling match. And that's enough for me. Like, and you can critique it like from a business standpoint and say that if these shows flowed better, more people would watch and you might, might very well be correct. But to me, that's the thing. It's like the build and the, the the shows, the creative, good or bad, I generally know that it's going to lead usually to a wrestling match that I want to see. And so that to me is 
is like a point of where I can be a little bit more forgiving of, of AEW's faults because generally speaking, their shows, while the pay-per-views, while long, usually have one or two matches on them at least that are like, yep, that's one of the best things I've seen all year. So you, I think some of this stuff is more forgivable for me because I feel that even if the journey is rocky, the destination will be uh, satisfying. And also, as you've pointed out, if you're just passively watching these shows for entertainment, not passively is maybe not the best term, but I can't think of a better one right now. If you're just watching these wrestling shows as entertainment, like, you know, I would, I don't care if they throw 500 things at the wall Mm -hmm. during a show and they immediately cut to the back and they have 68 guys and 3000 segments on each show. I don't care if I'm just watching it as entertainment. It's my job to make sure to try to keep track of all of this stuff. <laughs> and it's extremely difficult. I'm sure it is. <laughs> it's, it's really, really hard sometimes, you know? I, yeah, no, that makes sense. There's not a lot of graphics when matches are, are announced or talked about. Nope. Not a lot of follow up. There were a lot of video packages on this week's. AEW show, and I guess that's the other news out of out of AEW besides their shows that there was like a front office shakeup. They some, they <laughs> added some some existing people to their talent relations, and also hired Madison Rain as a new coach for the women's division. Yeah, Madison Rain doesn't stand out to me as like like if you if you were to give me a list of people to hire as head women's coach, I'm not sure she'd be on it. Not sure she wouldn't be on it, but. Like doesn't immediately stand out to me as wow mm-hmm. that is a great hire and someone I want teaching all of my people how to work. But you know, I also didn't sit th- think that all of this all of this front office stuff boded very well for Christopher Daniels. Well, I mean, he's he has been kind of the the point of contact and the name that gets mentioned when people like Marco Stunt or or Joey Janela have sort of voiced that. Yeah, kind of at a certain point, it was just radio silence. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not getting renewed. And then once like a couple of people publicly did the story, he's like, yep, then I got the call. Right. (laughs) Like after the Marco stuff, then he called me and said, like when I had less than 30 days left on my deal to say, hey, we're not bringing you back. Um, Right. Like, yeah, didn't doesn't sound like Chris was a. Again, that and that's that that's that position, right? You're the you're the bad guy for right. and you're the person that to an extent at least is there to protect upper management from right. from people's hurt feelings and people's frustrations with the inner workings of the company. Yep. So Sanjay Duck, QT Marshall, Pat Buck, and Tony Schiavone all got titles slash promotions. So, yeah, I'm not sure what the hierarchy is there. I mean, theoretically, I guess it's good that there are more people that, you know, if you're a a talent there, especially a talent that isn't, you know, maybe good friends with one of the EVPs or or someone and wants to, you know, has has a concern or a question they want to talk to that there's more people they can go to besides just Chris Daniels or Tony Khan himself. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. As far as Madison Rain is like a coach or one of the like the top women's coaches, it's like, yeah, I wouldn't say she would be like, like, I wouldn't put her on the level of like Serena Deeb, who they already have, who already is kind of doing that player coach role right. for them. But I mean, she is a woman who has like a decade and a half of wrestling on television experience. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm sure she has a lot of insight and and value and she's worn a lot of hats for impact as well over the years doing like commentary and behind the scenes stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure she has, (laughs) I'm sure she has uses, but yes, when I saw that as like, as, as the, the big name coming into to, to coach the women's division. I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I know she was on that first all in show. Um, she's in the women's match on that show. So, but also that was like a Cody and bucks joint. So not necessarily a Tony Khan joint, at least not officially that I'm aware of. So, right. Uh, it's interesting that 
that Tony would would bring that name in, but perhaps, you know, other people that are now in like Sanjay Dutt had, I think, also worked as like an agent and and in talent relations and stuff for impact. So maybe he put in a good word for her or or who knows? Sure. Uh G one's happening in New Japan. Don't care about that. Sure, sure. Uh, Rick Flair's last match. Oh yeah. <laughs> now this happened since we last recorded. I forgot. That was uh okay, so it did a four hundred forty eight thousand dollar gate and it did between like twenty five and thirty thousand pay per view buys. Um so as far as like an independent show, very financially successful. Mm-hmm. Um oh good. I was hoping Conrad would be financially <laughs> rewarded for this. Sure. Yeah. So um, I watched this show. I think you just caught highlights. Is that? Yes, I had. I think as we talked about a little bit last week, I had talked to a friend and we were kind of kicking the can down the road, talking about watching it. And then ultimately, we both uh, kind of of our own volition decided that we weren't going to watch it. So uh, and I didn't I couldn't. Uh, I didn't have enough interest in the show to watch it by myself. So I did not watch it, but I saw, I think I saw all of the relevant uh, <laughs> newsworthy <laughs> moments from the show. Yeah. I mean, it's a 73 year old guy who almost died a hundred times mm-hmm. having a match. Like what, what did we think was going to happen? Was, the undercard was fine. There was one really good Lucha match. There was a lot of, kind of rushed stuff that like there was nothing really great or bad on the show except for the main event which was really 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 bad jeff jarrett was the best worker in the match by a thousand miles (laughs) karen jarrett was the second best worker in the match by a thousand miles true (laughs) like andrade i don't know if he's hurt i thought i had read he was like dealing with some kind of injury coming in Sounds sounds right. Like, I think he's a guy who picks and chooses his spots anyway. With Jay Lethal, I think, I think if you're under contract to Tony Khan and you were in this match, he was just like, don't, don't get hurt. And um, I don't know that to be true, but I just anyway, Rick Rick Flair uh, hopefully will never wrestle again. <laughs> he f- he faked a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And then he, the big the big spot of the match was the 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 finish was Andrade giving him brass knocks, him hitting Jarrett with the brass knocks, and then pinning him with the figure four. So Flair could barely get the brass knocks. He's like shaking and trembling, and did the slowest figure four you've ever seen. And then it was the finish was a double pin, <laughs> but they didn't call it the double pin. It, it was just, it was really sad. And then as the bell rang, he told Andrade, I passed out. Ay, 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 ay. Yeah, it's, you know, it's my, my general thoughts when this was over and I was watching the highlights and you get a mix of, you got people just kind of making fun of it. And then you got people who are like, oh, this was so sad. And oh, it's so, so disappointing to, see such a great legend go out. And my, my general thought is considering, as you mentioned, Ric Flair has almost died several times Sure, from the plane crash on down. Right. There are many times where it seems like Ric Flair should probably have died and he didn't. Yes. And then all of some of the things he's been accused of. Yes. Uh, if the worst thing, if all this has cost him at the end of this is some dignity pretty good deal for Ric Flair I think like if all that's cost him he's I'm sure he made bank on this show and he was bragging about he's going to go party with Kid Rock after the show so you know what he's he's a 73 year old man who likes to pretend he's a 25 year old man and you can say that's sad you know I don't really feel that he's a figure that's deserving of sympathy <laughs> at this point in his life um, because a lot of his issues, I think, are certainly self-inflicted. But I also think if you're just looking at it, it kind of from a top-down view, 
he made it through it. He didn't die. <laughs> made some money. And yeah, people people should and rightfully will and will continue to mock him <laughs> for what was a, not a very good uh, performance. But hey, dignity is a small price to pay, I feel like, if you're a guy, again, who has cheated death and who has wronged and burnt wronged as many people and burned as many bridges as rick flair has over the years you know what dignity isn't the highest price you could you could be asking rick flair to pay you know that ship sailed a long time ago <laughs> if, if that was what like what you're what you're concerned about is dignity mm-hmm. like that like when he that, fell in the hole in tna <laughs> oh lord <laughs> A long time. That ship sailed so long ago. Yeah, I guess business wise, <laughs> this all appears to be appropriate business. Um, <laughs> there were a few things that, that stood out to me is like WWE, who who WWE let be a part of the show and who they did not. Mm-hmm. They let the uh, Undertaker sat in the front row and was on camera a hundred times during the show. Uh, they let Cody send in a video for the show. Uh, Sean appeared in, in a video on the show. I'm not sure that Sean knew he was doing a video for the <laughs> show. The way that the way that it came off, but but Charlotte was there and she was not on not on the show and was not allowed to sit ringside for the show, which was interesting. They and, gave her her gave her spot to uh, her sister. Yeah, yep, yeah. um, and. I guess WWE wanted to maybe use some footage or had a camera crew there or something along those lines for the show, but they couldn't reach a deal. And so footage was shown from the event on AEW television this week, but there was no, uh, I guess anything can happen. And if WWE wants to do a documentary about this someday or something, maybe they can reach a deal for the footage, but apparently they haven't yet. So Mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. All right. Anything else? No, I think that's the <laughs> that's the that's the big news of the week. I think we're we're fast on the road to this this castle show, and then this is traditionally the period of the year where WWE stops trying until the Royal Rumble. Yeah, so this is another test for Hunter. Does he keep that? Uh, does he keep that train rolling? And we get like, and Roman goes home until <laughs> the first week of January after the castle show. Or, uh, you know, we're going to actually try in the months of October and November this year. Well, we're going to get a draft. You know, Mm -hmm. what kind of Survivor Series stuff are they going to try to do? If anything, will we get war games at Survivor Series? There's a little more intrigue this year. War games on Vince's, one of Vince's big four shows. That would really be twisting the knife, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's still a wild dynamic. (laughs) It's absolutely wild dynamic. And like the week before Vince got forced out, we were on the show and I was saying, you know what? I think he's going to weather the storm. And it's just like, it is absolutely wild to me that he was forced out of his own, that, <laughs> that money, that money is even more powerful than him. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> the money spoke and it said that he was too much of a liability to be there anymore it's like if anyone on earth you would think would be so powerful within their own industry Mm -hmm. it would be him and he weathered it for months and then just one day he was gone it's him this thing yeah i feel like there's still like yeah i feel like there's still a sense of shock that maybe it hasn't fully hit us that like (laughs) that he's gone but And it's not like a oh this is a work kind of a thing. No, like a it's it's like a I've I have my entire life he has done this one thing and he is not doing this thing anymore, and he's not in charge anymore. And I don't believe it because I have not seen anything else in my almost thirty eight years. Yeah, it's what do you think he does? (laughs) Assuming he's like still running the company from the shadows or whatever. Yeah, that's I don't know. You Just know, working out and I don't know. What's in a day CDC? I, like, is he gonna die? Is he gonna die in the next three months or something? Like, that's your whole life, and then your life mm-hmm. 
you know, you just stop working, you start dying. Is that what's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> what can you do? Right. <laughs> He's got Alpha Entertainment. He's got that yeah. that shell company set up. It's like, does he okay? Does he want to, you know, make movies, pal, or something? Yeah. Now I don't know. He can do stuff. I mean, who yeah. knows? I mean, a lot of like some of these streaming, these smaller streaming services, they'll just like pick up movies that are made that just don't have a distribution deal yet. So, like, yeah, he could he could get into the entertainment industry if he wanted to. I he he could, but he'd have to like. He'd have to be slick about it because like he's he's kind of uh, radioactive right now. You right. Know? Once you resign, <laughs> then it's hard to come back. Yeah. If he had just stayed, it feels like people would have forgotten. But obviously, Wall Street didn't feel that way. So or the board of directors didn't feel that way. So, yeah. Damn this thing. Man. All right. Well, until next time, everybody. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. I saw the first clip I've ever seen of Jay Leno's You Bet Your Life the other day. Oh, oh boy. First of uh, all, just dreadful. Second of all, <laughs> he's doing headlines on it. Oh, tremendous. I was like, you <laughs> son of a bee. <laughs> he was doing headlines. And I was like, God, this guy. Oh, he still got it. <laughs> and it's like, it's like they either don't do like the laughter sign on the crowd. Right. Or it's like not a, I don't know, maybe it's not a big audience or something. So it's just like him doing it and then like Kevin reacting and like it's just silence. Where, where does this show air? It's, I guess it's a syndicated thing. I, yeah. so I wasn't aware of it. Like, I mean, I knew it was on because I think we had right. talked about it. Right. Or that it was coming, but I thought it had not debuted yet. And then, uh, my other my other podcast co-host informed me that it was airing and that it was terrible. <laughs> nice. And I was like, oh. And then he sent me a clip. And the best part of it, it's a clip. It's like a guy filming his television. <laughs> and it's Jay doing headlines on this You Bet Your Life show. And they're not funny, of course. Right. But it's like the best part is after everyone, the guy holding the photo is going, hey, now. <laughs> Oh, oh, Jay. <laughs> and I was like, that guy is funnier. That's the right. funniest part of this. It's uh, it's on at six and six thirty every weeknight here on uh, channel 54 WNUV. Oh, like cutting <laughs> into the eight hours of family feud that airs per day on on local Baltimore affiliates. You know, I'm, I'm generally like every time I watch, I like Steve Harvey and I think he's very good on that mm-hmm. show. And every time I turn it on, it's like, I find him entertaining, but also mm-hmm. can we have anything else? <laughs> Please. <laughs> could we get like a new million? Well, you're probably not going to get a, a cheap syndicated version of who wants to be a millionaire, but like George Lopez show. Right. <laughs> Oh, you mean like old sitcoms? I thought you meant like a different game show. No, 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 no. I mean show old sitcoms. Oh, yeah, yeah. Could do that. There's like, what about all those shows that are on ABC that have been yes. on for like six years, but yes. you don't know anyone who's watched a single episode of any of them? Certainly those could be in syndication by now. Yes, the Goldbergs, mm-hmm. Fresh Off the Boat, Blackish. The one, the one with Diedrich Bader. Sure. <laughs> It was thought about your thing of you know the shows exist that you, no one you know has ever seen a single episode of, but they've mm-hmm. been on five hundred seasons. Uh, MacGyver was on um, like Channel Thirteen overnight one night this week, and mm-hmm. I'm like, huh, I forgot that was the MacGyver reboot was a thing. Let me check it. It's like, <laughs> yep, it's now in season six. <laughs> like, Ridiculous! Like what? <laughs> I have never. I'm barely aware that this thing exists and it's on CBS in like season six. Amazing. Like, <laughs> I guess it's just like people who watch 
network television at this point. It's just like, well, this is the show. This is the show that's on, and I will watch it. Yeah. Until I die. <laughs> yeah. You just turn. You keep the. You keep the station on all night. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's gonna say something else here, and I can't remember what it was. Uh, something about TV, obviously. It's about uh-huh. the George Lopez show. Uh, it's on. T- well, if you leave the TV on TBS and then you go and you walk the dog, and you come back and George Lopez show is still on. It's. I've seen some episodes recently. <laughs> Tell you what, that um, those sh- those shows. The further away we get from like the multicam sitcom, the better those shows are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was uh, so I got <laughs> again. I got back from wa- walking the dog one night. It was like two thirty in the morning, and uh, uh, Entertainment Tonight was on uh, Channel <laughs> Thir- on CBS, and I'm watching it, and they're like interviewing Blake, Sh- uh, not Blake Shelton. Um, trace adkins and they're mm-hmm. like dude you have finally done it honky tonk badonk donk has just gone platinum <laughs> and i'm like did i suffer a head injury what year is this <laughs> it's like yes here in 2022 honky tonk badonk donk has finally gone platinum <laughs> and I'm like what and then you, you google it or whatever and it's that that, that song came out in 2004 yeah <laughs> How? What? What is ha- <laughs> what is happening? Did I fall and hit my head and, w- and wake up eighteen years in the past? Apparently not. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I mostly think of that song because there's a Craig Ferguson opening <laughs> where the where the crocodile puppet sings it. I think <laughs> tremendous. It was a good game. I mean, it got it got really loud. The loudest the crowd was for the whole game was doing the wave, of course. <laughs> It's always a little bit disheartening, especially because they were doing it while the Orioles were up to bat with runners on base. Good. Baltimore, <laughs> Baltimore sports fans. Get bored easily. Yes. When Let's their see. team is winning and up to bat. They, <laughs> that's not exciting enough, so we need to start doing the wave. Um, but yeah, it was cool. I heard uh, Hyde afterwards in his press conference was like, that's the best crowd we've ever had since I've been here. <laughs> He said it's the first time he's ever heard like a, a huge crowd like this where it felt like all of them were Orioles fans. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I was like, that's I, I guess he and he's talking about like, oh well, we've had big crowds, but a lot of time it's like half Yankee fans or right. more than half, probably in some of these years he's been here. Um, so I was like, that's cool. I'm glad for him. And he was really he was really jazzed about Brooks and Eddie being there. And he said they I think he said they spoke to the uh, to the guys before before the the ceremonies and stuff. I'm not sure why Brooks was there for a Camden Yards ceremony. Sure, but it, yeah, he but Hyde seemed pretty pretty jazzed up afterwards. I was like, that's cool, especially because you know they traded away his closer and <laughs> and uh, you know the consensus team leader last week. Yes, like yeah, he's. And just, you know, the general put upon nature of Brandon Hyde (laughs) for having to be the manager of this team for the last four years. Yes. It was nice to I try to keep on keeping on.